Portland State University. Okay, please. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is David Poliot, and this is joint work with my advisor, Charles Wright. Uh, our contribution is we present new attacks on efficiently searchable encryption schemes that have been proposed in recent work. Our attack model is passive. We only require a copy of the ciphertext data and a little bit of auxiliary data to perform our attack. And in real email, email experiments, our attacks perform 12 times better than frequency analysis and 300 times better than random guessing. Uh, as you can see from this list, attacks on searching encrypted data has become uh, an active area of research recently. Uh, we all seem to understand that all the practical searchable encryption schemes leak some data. What we're trying to understand is, you know, what does this mean? What, is the, what are the ramifications of this leakage? Uh, our focus is on uh, a type of scheme that we, uh, that's been called easily deployable. So it's something that can be deployed on top of something that's already existing. Uh, we looked at two uh, constructions in particular. The first was from ShadowCrypt in 2014. Uh, ShadowCrypt provided a web browser extension that would allow users to upload encrypted data to web applications. And uh, similarly, the Mimesis project, they provided an Android encryption layer that worked between the user and the applications. Uh, basically, both of these systems allowed you to do something like a Gmail with searchable encryption with no changes to the server or the software. Um, because they were constrained to, uh, to using existing software and services, uh, they weren't able to use some of the SSE type schemes that, uh, have, uh, that have better security. Uh, they were constrained to uh, use usually some sort of deterministic encryption, which is known for its leakage. So here's kind of the motivation for looking at these easily deployable schemes. Um, as you can see from this quote, the uh, the, the big, the, the big uh, email providers aren't really interested in providing searchable encryption for us. If they did that, they wouldn't be able to see the contents of emails, which wouldn't allow them to search them for things like ad targeting and other services. So this is why we feel like these projects like Nemesis, that means like Mimesis and Shadow Crypto are important. So before we uh, get into how these schemes work, we need to understand, and because we're using them on top of an existing email server, we need to understand how these servers perform full text searching. So they essentially, they take an example email such as this one. And the first thing they do is they remove all the stop words. So all the common words that you would have no reason to search for. Uh, they also then convert the rest of the words to lower case so that the searches are not case sensitive. And then you're left with a set of keywords that you will use to build an index. So the server then takes all the keywords and it creates this index, which is a list of the keywords and then also a list of all the documents that contain those keywords. And they sort the keywords into alphabetical order, which allows them to perform fast searches and lookups for full text searches. So now we'll get into how ShadowCrypt implements searchable encryption. Uh, the first thing their client does is it will take their email and it will encrypt the entire contents of the email with a standard encryption scheme. Then you just end up with some, something that's undecipherable. But then it'll do something to what the email server will do and that is it will grab all of the keywords and they will encrypt them with a deterministic encryption scheme. So we end up with all of these uh, encrypt, deterministically encrypted search tags. All of these encrypted search tags are then appended to the body of the encrypted email. And they're appended in alphabetical order by the ciphertext so that an adversary can't learn anything based on the order that they appear in the document. This is then uploaded to the email server and the email server simply creates its indexes like it normally would, but this case it's based on the ciphertext keyword search tags. And before we get into uh, Mimesis construction, we need a little bit of background information on Bloom filters in case you haven't seen a Bloom filter before. Uh, a Bloom filter is a data structure that's designed to be space efficient, 
while also at the same time allowing fast lookup and insertion. Uh, to insert something inside of a bloom filter, um, you simply uh, take the item that's going to be inserted and you take k different hashes of it. And then the output of all those hash functions you use as an index to a bit array. And you simply set the, uh, the bits at all of those indexes to one. Uh, search is very similar. You take the item that we'd like to search for, you perform the same number of hashes, but instead of setting the bits to one, you simply check that they're set to one for search. Uh, however, a typical email server doesn't give us a bloom filter to use. So what Memesis does with their construction is they, is they cut off the last step. So they take their item to be inserted and they take k different hash functions and then they just stop with the outputs of those hash functions. Oh, and one more thing. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, because these are referred to, because they're hash outputs, but they also represent bits that appear in a bloom filter, Sometimes I might call them bits, sometimes I might call them hashes because they're essentially the same thing. Uh, this is just Memesis' representation of a hash, uh, I mean, of a bloom filter, but just as a set of hashes instead. So, uh, Memesis performs the same, uh, very similar steps. They take all the keywords, but instead of hashing them once, they hash them k times. Uh, and then also they use a keyed hash, so to prevent dictionary attacks. And again, just like before, they append all of these uh, encrypted tags to the body of the encrypted document. And this is uploaded to the server, and the server will create its indexes based on all these ciphertext search tags. Okay, so we just reviewed how uh, ShadowCrypt and Mimesis uh, implemented their searchable encryption scheme. Before we get into our attack, I thought I'd review just what a classical frequency analysis attack looks like. Uh, with a classical frequency analysis attack, you simply are calculating the frequencies that, of the keyword search tags. So in one table, we, have, we, we look up how often each ciphertext keyword appears in a set of documents. And then we might have some auxiliary data, or an attacker would have some auxiliary data on some user. Uh, either another set of emails from a different time period or a different account, and they perform the same step, but with the plain text keyword search, search tags. They calculate the, fre the frequencies of those search tags, and then they match up the plain text keywords with the ciphertext keywords based on their frequency. Uh, but the seams here leak more information than just the frequencies of words. Our attack, in, in particular, takes advantage of the co-occurrence frequencies. So that is how often two words will appear together in the same document. And before we jump into that, I just also wanted to define what we mean by weighted graph matching. Um, most of you, if you hear graph matching, you might think of a bipartite graph. Uh, this is different from that. With weighted graph matching, uh, we're given two graphs, G and H, and here they're represented as adjacency matrices. And the numbers in the matrices represent the weights of the edges between nodes in the graph. So with a weighted graph matching, we simply want to find a permutation from one graph to the other that makes it, close, that makes it closely resemble that one as close as possible. So to reduce our keyword recovery attack to a weighted graph matching, we simply go through our ciphertext emails and calculate the co-occurrences of all the keyword search tags. Once we've calculated this, we build a co-occurrence graph. So again, a graph is represented as an adjacency matrix. Uh, the numbers in the matrix are the weights of the edges between the nodes. And in this case, those represent the co-occurrences between two ciphertext search tags. We perform the same step with our auxiliary information. So we calculate the co-occurrences of our plain text search tags. From this co-occurrence frequencies, we build another graph very similar. Again, the represented as an adjacency matrix where the numbers are the co-occurrences between keywords.
Okay, so now we have our two graphs. We have our ciphertext co-occurrence graph and we have our plaintext co-occurrence graph. And so now we run the graph matching. And uh, with the weighted graph matching, there's lots of already known algorithms for this and there's open source software as well. The particular algorithm that we use uh, was n cubed complexity based on the size of the graph. So in order to test how well our attack worked, uh, we ran some experiments with the Enron email data set. Uh, this data set has over 140 different users and about a half million different emails. We would run this attack for every single user. So what we would do is for each user, we'd randomly select half of their emails to encrypt and then we'd use the other half as our auxiliary data. And then we would also target a certain number of words. So we target the top 100 keywords, top 200 keywords, and so on up to the top 1,000 keywords. This graph uh, shows how well the our attack did against the shadow crypt construction. On the X axis is the attack accuracy, and the Y axis is a CDF of the number of Enron users. So for example, with 10% of the Enron users, we achieved about 90 over 90% attack accuracy. And for about half of the Enron users, as you can see, we achieved anywhere between 50 and about 80% attack accuracy on recovering those keywords. Uh, the next graph has the same information but instead is simply an average over all of the users. And to compare it, we also ran the classical frequency analysis attack on the same set of data, just to see how well uh, of an improvement we might get. And as you can see, we consistently recovered well over 50% of the keywords. Okay, so with the Mammoth's construction, uh, we have an additional step. Because with ShadowCrypt, there is one ciphertext search tag for each keyword. But with the Memesis construction, we have K ciphertext uh, search tags for each keyword. And so we have to figure out, uh, we have to figure out which ciphertext keywords belong to together. Or I'm sorry, ciphertext tags belong together for one keyword. Once we've done that, then we can run our weighted graph matching attack. So the first thing we do in this uh, to recover these search tags is we look at our bloom filters or our hash frequencies uh, and we notice that uh, we see sets of these hashes that have the same count or occur at the same frequency and this this is an example from a real Enron user uh, where we found a couple of sets of hashes all with the same count and they all have and we found we found these in some groups of 10. So we'd analyze this data it would look something like this for, for every document count, we would have like a set of hashes or bits that had, the, that had the same count. And in this case here, there's a few groups that had a count of 10. And it just so happens that with the Memesis construction, uh, 10 was the number of hashes that they used with their bloom filter construction. So obvious, so it seems obvious that these sets with, uh, the, these sets of 10 hashes are almost certainly one keyword, at least with a very high probability. but we have some other things to deal with, like there, every once in a while there'll be a collision with the hash function, and we have to figure out which one of these, you know, from the set of 11 belongs with the set of nine. And there were some tricks that we employed to do that. But we also found we don't necessarily have to restrict ourselves to finding all 10 hashes for each keyword. We found that if we found nine hashes or eight hashes that, that belong together, we still, uh, those still would form a keyword with a very high probability. And then what was left is we'd have larger sets that we would somehow have to split into sets of 10 to find those keywords. Um, we don't have enough time to go into detail on how we did that in this talk, but that is thoroughly explained in the paper. So if you're interested in that, I encourage you to read the paper. This graph shows how well our tag finding algorithm did uh, with the Memesis construction. On the x-axis is the vocabulary size that we were targeting, and on the y-axis is the attack accuracy. And as you can see, we consistently found roughly between 85 to 95 percent of the keywords from all of the hashes. Uh, 
Once we've found all of our keywords, we can then run our weighted graph matching attack. And this graph here shows how well our, our attack did with the Memesis construction compared to the Shadow Crips construction, and then also compared to frequency analysis. As you can see from this graph, and it's something that we noticed, that the accuracy, uh, how well we did finding the keywords, uh, had a very big impact on the attack accuracy from our weighted graph matching. This kind of gives us some hint at a possible mitigation that we might use for our attack. If we can prevent an adversary from finding the keywords to begin with, uh, we can prevent them from uh, running the attack. So we started looking into the bloom filter formulas and the parameters that go with them. And there's one in particular that we were interested in. So if you look at all the parameters that go into a bloom filter, there's a formula for the probability that any one bit is being set or that any one particular hash is found. And that formula is right up here. Uh, when we use the same parameters with the Mimesis construction, we found that this probability was very low, as you can see here. So that led us to a thought, well, maybe uh, modifying these parameters might be able to give us a possible defense. And intuitively, you can, think, you can see it as, well, if there's a very low probability of any, ha of any hash occurring, that means really there's very close to a one-to-one -one correspondence between the words that appear and the hashes that are set. And that's what our tag finding algorithm relies on. If we can break this one-to-one -one correspondence, uh, that might be a possible defense against this attack. So this table kind of gives some insight as to how effective this might be. And there's a lot of information here, so I'll try and go through it one step at a time. Uh, the column on the left is simply uh, the word rank, and we looked at all the Enron users and took their average for this. Second column is just the probability that that word would appear in any given document or the frequency that it appears over the corpus of documents. Uh, the last four columns are where it gets interesting though. Uh, what we're looking at here is uh, there's different uh, values of Q, which is the probability that we see any given hash in, uh, in an email. Um, so, but what, what we're looking at is we're assuming that for a particular bit or hash that the, wor that the word in the first column sets that bit. And then we also have a background setting of bits from the Q value or the probability that any bit is being set. And what you notice is with the parameters from the Mimesis project, that probability is almost identical to the probability that we see a word. So and what, what this means is that that particular word is likely the only word that will set this bit or result in that hash. But if we modify the parameters of our Bloom filter to increase this probability, uh, then the probability that we see this hash in any email uh, becomes dominated by the probability of just seeing it in general and not by one particular word. So in other words, uh, there's going to be multiple words that will set this hash value. So there'll be collisions with the hash functions. And this should make it harder to distinguish which hash values belong to a particular word. So we did some experiments with this, changing the Bloom filter parameters. Uh, on the y-axis is our average accuracy of our tag finding algorithm. And on the x-axis, we modified just one parameter, the Bloom filter size, which impacted the uh, probability that any bit was set or that we saw any particular hash value. And that's also on that, on that axis. And that also affected the false positive rate. And as you can see from the chart, as we modified the values which increased the probability that we saw any particular hash, our tag finding algorithm accuracy approached zero. Now the false positive rate also would start to go up, but you can see there's lots of instances where uh, the TAC accuracy was zero or close to zero, and there are still some reasonable false positive values. So that seems to be kind of the sweet spot that 
you would want to use for your bloom filter parameters. So in conclusion, we, prevent, we presented new inference attacks on two new constructions that are proposed in recent works. Some future work that we're looking to do is to see if these, this type of weighted graph matching attack can be used for other systems, such as SSE systems. And we also are going to be looking into seeing if tuning these bloom filters is, uh, you know, can be a, is a possible defense. It worked against our system, but there might be some more sophisticated attacks that it may not work against. So we want to uh, see if there's a proof that it, it could be used as a defense or find a counterexample that shows that no, it's not enough. Okay. Any questions? Questions? Hi, Patty Savannah, Royal Holloway. Uh, the weighted graph matching problems you solved, the two graphs have the same number of nodes. Yes. Right? So that corresponds to the entire vocabulary of the auxiliary data appearing in the target data. Well, actually, in the, in the experiments, the, uh, the vocabulary words weren't always the same. In fact, often our auxiliary data would contain words that our target data did not. Okay. Okay, okay. so they were, they were definitely different sets of data. You know, they had enough words in common that we were able to perform the attack, but they certainly did not have the same sets of words. Okay, my question was going to be how well would it perform if you were kind of looking for a subgraph in the larger graph from the auxiliary data? Did you, did you look at that? Um, no, that's something interesting that, that we didn't look into, but uh, that's a good idea. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Ian Myers, Johns Hopkins. Did you guys consider anything other than the Enron data set? Because there's some notorious jokes about most of the writing in there being the same exact uh, Berkeley Business School uh, <laughs> sort of boilerplate. So you might imagine an inference attack should be a little more effective. Well, we also ran some of these experiments on Ubuntu chat data. I just didn't include them here for, okay. for you know. Uh, some of the Ubuntu chat data graphs are in the paper. And uh, what we found with the Ubuntu chat data, you know, we, we achieved similar results, but just not not quite as good, sim sim simply because the you know auxiliary data wasn't quite as good of a match for the for the uh, ciphertext data. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's All right. send the speaker. <laughs>